Welcome back, everyone. Well, right now everybody's talking about Napoleon because of the release of the trailer yesterday for Ridley Scott and Joaquin Phoenix's movie on Napoleon. And uh, many of you have discovered this channel because of my reaction, my breakdown of that trailer. Uh, so we're going to dive back into some Napoleonic history, ride the wave for a little while. If you're new to the channel, uh, hi, my name's Chris, and uh, I do kind of a mix of reactions, breakdowns, really, of uh, historical uh, content on YouTube, but also my own original content. And if you go to my homepage, you can see a lot of both. Most of my original content is uh, from historic sites that I go there and vlog live, but um, there's also other original content too. Uh, but what we really do is we take these, these videos and use them as our textbook to have a deeper conversation to talk a little bit more about the history. And that's what we're going to continue to do now uh, with Epic History TV. If you haven't already seen it, uh, I have done over the last two years a uh, reaction to all of Epic History TV's videos on the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, did the first ones about two years ago and then I went back to it and did the rest about six months to a year ago. I know they've also got Napoleon's Marshals, which we haven't done yet. Uh, but they also just recently came out with a series on Napoleon's first campaign. That was his campaign in Italy. That's where the legend of Napoleon Bonaparte is really born. That's where it all gets started. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at that today. As always, I'll put a link in the description to the original content. Highly encourage you to go and watch the entire series on Epic History TV. Not only because it gives you kind of a little bit of a taste of what we're going to be looking at before we go back and do commentary, but also because it's really important for us to support these original content creators who do such a fantastic job with this stuff in the first place. Uh, I'll put a link in, in the description as well as at the end to the rest of my playlist of all of Epic History TV's stuff that they did, so you can check that out as well. Let's go ahead and dive in. Napoleon's first campaign. I believe this is a four-part series. History TV, PMF Productions, collaboration. In 1796, at the height of the French Revolutionary Wars, a young French general took charge of a ragged, demoralized army in northern Italy. It was his first command. Many expected him to fail. Instead, in just one month, he won his first brilliant campaign. So real quick, I don't know how much of his background they're going to get into here, but Napoleon, by this point, he's born in 1769. Uh, so he's like 27 years old at this point, 26, 27. Uh, he's not ethnically French. He is ethnically Italian. His family is from a, a minor uh, an Ita Italian family that is living on Corsica, which right around the time Napoleon is born uh, becomes French. Uh, so he does not grow up speaking French. He starts speaking French when he comes to France to go to military school. His dad is a diplomat. And uh, so he always speaks French with an accent, uh, with a Corsican accent. Uh, and it's only right around the time of these uh, Italian campaigns when he starts spelling his name Bonaparte. It was Buonaparte. It was Italian. Uh, so he, he changes it to make it look less Italian. He starts signing his name, Napoleon Bonaparte, at this point. Uh, but this is really, a lot of historians believe that this is where the legend of Napoleon's born, that this campaign may have been his best campaign. So I'll be interested to see how it all gets started. With astonishing self-confidence, boldness, and energy, he led his army to victory after victory, transforming the war in Europe winning praise from a grateful republic, and forging a legend. This is the story of Napoleon Bonaparte's first campaign, and the dawn of a new age. It's not his first combat, it's his first campaign where he gets given command of an army. Uh, where he's really able to show what he can do. He's commanded troops before this, he, uh, he rises through the ranks through the artillery. Seventeen ninety two. Europe is plunged into conflict by revolution in France. At first, it seems this infant republic will be quickly snuffed out by her neighbors. And why does that matter? Because if you are a monarchy uh, and you see what's happening in France, you know this stuff can spread. And we see that happen in 1848, where 
revolution breaks out all over the place. Uh, and not only that, but the, the violence of this uh, revolution and the fact that they execute not only their monarch, but also his wife, who's an Austrian princess, does not sit well with a lot of these other countries. Incredibly, France clings on, thanks to mass mobilization, patriotic fervor, and her traditional military power. Yeah. In 1795, France occupies the Low Countries, while Prussia and Spain withdraw from the war. But the French Republic still faces a powerful coalition of enemies, which includes the Austrian Empire and kingdoms of Piedmont, Sardinia, Naples and Great Britain, as well as a counter-revolutionary revolt in the Vendée region of Western France. So one of the things that France has going for it at this time is that you don't have a lot of very large powerful empires in Central and Western Europe at this point. You have Austria, uh, but Prussia is an emerging power. Germany is by no means united. And there's all these different states that at any given point are going to side with one side or the other. The Holy Roman Empire is in its final years and it's going to die because of the Napoleonic Wars. Italy is not united yet. Spain is, but they're not that powerful at this point. It's really Britain and their sea power and Austria and their army. And then, of course, you have Russia sitting all the way over there in the east. In Paris, the most extreme revolutionaries had been toppled, sent to the guillotine, as they had sent so many before them. France is now governed by the Directory, a more moderate five-man committee, which quickly wins a reputation for corruption and inefficiency. Nevertheless, in 1796, they plan a major military offensive to knock their most dangerous adversary, Austria, out of the war. The two main efforts will be made along the Rhine by powerful armies under General Jourdan and General Moreau. A third effort, of which much less is expected, will be made in northern Italy. Of the which much less is expected. Obviously, they have their hierarchy of where they think the real f threat is, and the real threat is Austria. Italy is kind of a sideshow. It's, it's more just protecting the southern border. It's keeping them from being able to help out and reinforce the, uh, the northern army. So, and you can see that by the number of men, 150,000, 160,000 almost in the north, compared to just 50,000 in the south. The French army of Italy is a poor cousin, starved of money and supplies, stripped of troops to reinforce French forces on the Rhine. But its fortunes are about to change. On the 2nd of March, 1796, the Directory appoint a new commander to lead the army, one of France's youngest generals, Napoleon Bonaparte. We're delighted to welcome back as video sponsor NapoleonSouvenirs.com, the online shop for all fans of the Napoleonic era. Really? Since 2010, the team at NapoleonSouvenirs.com has offered the finest quality gifts and souvenirs for all those who adore the Napoleonic era. We, my daughter and I were in Paris uh, about a month and a half ago, and we went to Napoleon's tomb at Des Invalides, and... Uh, they had all this Napoleonic like merch sell for sale there. My daughter bought a uh, a journal that had Napoleon's like insignia on it, and she uses that to write. And it's pre it's pretty cool. Their enormous range of gifts includes busts of the emperor himself, replica Napoleonic firearms, flags, statuettes, imperial eagles, and uniforms and sensational replica swords and sabers. Okay, that, as well that's kind of cool. our old favorite, a replica baton of a French maréchal. I'm not going to get into it right now, but like on the video, but I'm definitely going to have to check this out. That looks pretty awesome. You can visit their online store at napoleonsouvenirs.com or if you're in Paris, visit the Boutique Napoleon in person. Should have went there. Vive l'Empereur! And big thanks to NapoleonSouvenirs.com for sponsoring this video. Mm, 
that's that's a powerful quote right there. That's Napoleon good stuff. arrives at the Army of Italy's headquarters in Nice on the 25th of March. He is just 26 years old. Two years have passed since he masterminded French victory at the Siege of Toulon. Complete side note, uh, we're going to be playing uh, Total War Napoleon on my gaming channel, VTH Gaming. The link's in the description below. Uh, and it's going to be this campaign that we start out with. So if you want to check that out, the first episode should be going up later today. Since then, his fortunes have been mixed. A short spell as artillery commander in Italy. Ten days in jail when his political patrons fell from power. He then refused to serve in the Vendée, fighting French counter-revolutionaries, leading to several months' unemployment in Paris. Then, an extraordinary break. 13 yep. Vendémières, Paris. A royalist mob threat. Why is it 13 Vendémières but 5th of October? Because part of the French Revolution, they completely changed the calendar to a brand new calendar. So at this point, they're using that calendar to storm the national government. Napoleon is the closest general to hand and put in charge of its defense. He disperses the crowds with, with brutal shot. efficiency and is acclaimed savior of the revolution. And there's actually a real quick clip of that scene of that happening in the trailer for the movie. A grateful directory promotes Napoleon to general of division and awards him command of the Army of Italy. On the 9th of March, he marries his great love, Josephine de Beauharnais, and leaves for the front two days later. She was older than him. Her first husband was executed during the terror uh, by guillotine uh, and is actually buried in a mass grave that's right next to where um, the Marquis de Lafayette's buried. There are French generals in Italy with a better claim to command than Napoleon. Serrurier, a professional soldier who first saw action in the Seven Years' War, a decade before Napoleon was born. Augereau, a tough, experienced soldier, bold tactician and committed Republican. And Massena, risen from the ranks, fearless, tireless, Hero of the Battle of Loano against the Austrians the year before. So this just goes to show you that nobody's an island, right? Nobody can completely just rise through the ranks on their own, on the merits of their own ability. You have to have opportunities. And in this case, Napoleon gets an opportunity because of taking advantage of a situation, of his connections to the directory. It's not because he's next in line. So had one of these other kind of more deserving generals been given that command, we maybe never find out about the greatness of Napoleon Bonaparte. All three would later become marshals of Napoleon's empire. For now, Napoleon seems to these veterans, young and underqualified, a political appointment, embarrassingly infatuated with his new wife. But there is something about the Corsican. As Massena observed, his small size and puny face did not put him in their favor. But as soon as he donned his mm. general's hat, he seemed to grow by two feet. Napoleon impresses above all with his tireless energy. And he has much to do. His army is organized into Massena's advance guard of two divisions, one led by a hard-fighting Swiss general, La Harpe, and the other by Menier, whom Napoleon soon decides is incompetent. The main body comprises the divisions of Augereau, Serrurier, and two smaller divisions under Macquart and Garnier. This is a, a great point when they talk about him deciding this one guy's incompetent. One of the underrated qualities that Napoleon has is his ability to recognize and promote talent. His marshals, many of them are fantastic. 
Uh, and, and we talk a lot about how Napoleon wins battle after battle, but his marshals also have some really shining moments and do some great things themselves. The cavalry is led by General Stengel. But the army of Italy has been shockingly neglected by the Directory. The men are hungry and unpaid, with a few units on the verge of mutiny. Some men don't even have shoes or muskets. Napoleon inspects the troops and studies reports. He enforces discipline and breaks up rotten units. He is assisted by his aide-de-camp, Junot, Marmont, and a dashing cavalry colonel, Joachim Murat. As emperor, Napoleon will make two of these men dukes, and one a king. Yep. His most valuable assistant is his new chief of staff, General Berthier, Berthier who helps him to reorganize the army's supply system and scour southern France for food, transport, and forage. Another really underestimated part of Napoleon's uh, ability is it's not just about leading troops on the field. It's not just about campaigns and tactics. This is so much about logistics. And Napoleon is brilliant when it comes to how he organizes his army, how he supplies his army, how he's able to move his army. The situation begins to improve. But Napoleon knows what will really rejuvenate his ragged divisions. Victory. Victory in battle and the promise of plunder. Gotta get paid. Hmm. Morale, huge. Napoleon has spent two years studying the situation in northern Italy and the history of past wars here. He has developed clear plans on how the campaign must be fought. Now, Think about all of that. Studying history, understanding what has worked in the past and what hasn't, uh, taking time to understand your enemy, not just diving into it rashly, but really taking the time to think. Oh he will put them into action. Napoleon, with 38,000 troops, outnumbers the Piedmontese and the Austrian army. As long as they're separate. But if they combine, he will be outnumbered, so he must prevent this at all costs. His plan bears all the hallmarks of what will become known as the Napoleonic art of war. A bold, rapid advance, not against the expected target, Genoa, but Dago. Here, he will occupy the central position and prize his enemies mm. apart. He knows that when threatened, the Piedmontese will retreat on their capital, Turin, the Austrians on Milan. Divide and conquer. With his enemies divided, unable to support each other, he can defeat each in detail. Classic. Napoleon's plan will be aided by the fragility of the Austro-Piedmontese alliance. They regard each other with deep distrust after years of rivalry. We talk about this all the time. It's the whole classic, the enemy of my enemy is my friend thing. Uh, but that means that as long as they're focused on the enemy, they're friends. But if you can cause them to focus on their problems and their, dis their disagreements rather than their common enemy, uh, you can change the outcome. The new Austrian commander, General Beaulieu, is experienced and was once considered energetic, but he is now 70 years old and does not know Italy. He is convinced the French will target Genoa, the port used by the British to supply their coalition allies. So much so that he rejects Piedmontese plans for close cooperation. Their troops remain scattered across mountain passes in a general defence against invasion. On the 4th of April, Napoleon moves his headquarters forward to Albenga in preparation for his offensive. But Beaulieu strikes first. On the 10th of April, Austrian troops take Voltri to disrupt the expected French attack on Genoa. The small French garrison falls back to join Massena's advance guard at Savona. 
but Beaulieu's fixation with Genoa is playing into Napoleon's hands. Dago, with its vital crossroads that link the Piedmontese and Austrian armies, is covered by just 8,000 men mm. of Argento's corps. Roads, where do roads connect? How many times have we seen battles happen because of key crossroad places? That's what Gettysburg is all about. That's why we see the uh, fighting that takes place at Bastogne during the Battle of the Bulge. It's all about that road network. Mountainous terrain means Beaulieu can only march to Argento's aid via Acqui, more than 20 miles to the north. What's more, Argento has orders to take French positions at Montenotte as a diversion for the attack at Voltri. But the French cling on courageously. Corporal Roach particularly distinguishes himself, exposing himself to enemy fire to shoot down on the enemy. His commander, Colonel Rampon, tells his men, here we must conquer or die. Mm. A moment which quickly enters French military folklore. It's the perfect setup for Napoleon. The enemy's attention is focused on Voltri, and Argenteau's corps has been left dangerously exposed. He swings into action, sending La Harpe's division to reinforce Rampon's troops while Massena makes a tough night march across steep ravines in rain and fog to turn Argento's right flank. That's another classic thing we're going to see from Napoleon throughout his time in these campaigns is rapid movements, doing things the enemy doesn't expect you to be able to do. By dawn, the Austrians are outnumbered, outflanked, and under heavy attack they retreat in disarray. Napoleon orders Massena to move on Dago, while he turns his attention to the Piedmontese. But Augereau's advance gets held up at Cosseria. The old castle is held by Piedmontese and Croatian grenadiers. Notice the dates on all of this. This is all happening in a span of a few days. This is, hasn't even been a week with all of these battles so far. This is happening quickly. The French launch frontal attacks into withering fire and suffer hundreds of casualties. When the colonel of the 18th Demi Brigade is killed, a 26-year-old Louis-Gabriel Suchet takes over command. I have never seen fire like it, wrote Marmont, Napoleon's aide-de-camp. Despite heroic resistance, the hopelessly outnumbered garrison surrenders the next day. With Serrurier's division also advancing from the south, Piedmontese commander General Colli has little choice but to abandon his position at Montezemolo. The so you notice he does have uh, a force over here, northeast of Savona to kind of keep an eye on that Austrian army that he knows is over there protecting Genoa. Uh, so you're going to have to just kind of always be aware of what's going on out there on your flanks. Same day, under Napoleon's watchful eye, Massena takes Dago. But while La Harpe's division moves off to reinforce Augereau, hungry French troops left in Dago turn to plunder and pillage. No one spots Colonel Vukasovic, a tough Croatian commander, approaching with 3,000 reinforcements. He attacks at dawn, routing the French and retaking Dago with ease. It requires the recall of La Harpe's division and another day of heavy combat before Vukasovic can be wow. driven out of Dago. Look at that. A bayonet charge led by 27-year-old Colonel Lan. Lan wins particular praise from Je Really cool knowing the future of a lot of these guys and seeing how they are all going to rise up as well. So it's not just Napoleon who rises through the ranks on the merits of his ability. It's him bringing up with him other people who have distinguished themselves and show what they can do. General Bonaparte. Napoleon has won three victories in four days. The marches and battles have been grueling, but he has achieved his first objective. The Austrians are regrouping at Acqui and will soon retreat to Alessandria. 
they can offer no support to the Piedmontese. And so General Colli orders another withdrawal to a strong defensive position behind the Corsalia River. Napoleon orders an immediate attack. Augereau's division on the right, Serrurier on the left, Massena in support. But the French, under heavy fire, struggle to cross the swollen river with its steep banks. When Serrurier's troops finally get into San Michele, they immediately begin looting the town and are thrown out by a counterattack. Despite his success, Colli is still heavily outnumbered and fears encirclement. The following evening, he begins a covert withdrawal to Mondovi. But Napoleon is not deceived by the fake campfires. Patrols confirm his suspicions. The Piedmontese are pulling back. Th that's a common tactic that was used a lot at this time, is to leave a few men behind with campfires uh, to let your enemy think that your army is still there. Have men walk back and forth in front of the campfire so that you see the blinking and you think that there's a lot of activity. Uh, and, it, and it works a lot of the time, but in this case it doesn't. Though his troops are exhausted, wet and hungry, he launches them after the fleeing enemy. Colley's troops are caught before they can establish a new defensive line. The brave and popular General Dicat is killed. Retreat turns to rout. The French enter Mondovi in triumph, where at last, briefly, they can eat and rest. Mm. Building confidence. This is where you start winning victories and you turn an army that has previously been an afterthought into feeling like they can conquer the world, man. They can do anything. And now you've got a fighting force that if it's well-fed, if it's well-equipped, if it's well-led, can do anything. General Colley, his defeated troops scattered and demoralized, requests an armistice. Napoleon declines as his troops descend from the mountains into the fertile plain of Piedmont. That's a tactic that gets used a lot by people who know that there are other armies out there that if they can just buy some time, might come to their aid. Just, just let's just have a break. Let's just take a break. Let's not fight for a while. Napoleon's not buying it. Destitute and starved, French soldiers now plunder the Italian countryside freely. Brigadier General Joubert is among those frustrated by the men's conduct. Everything would go very well if the soldiers did not abandon themselves to pillage. Not a day passes without some looters being shot. Despite this severity, the mania doesn't stop. The rural folk are arming themselves. You do not want to turn the populace into active combatants in all of this. And you do not want to be distracted by loot and weighed down by loot. You've got to bring some discipline to this situation. Napoleon condemns such behavior, but his orders have limited impact, especially as everyone knows Generals Massena and Augereau to be two of the greatest offenders. Hmm. That doesn't help. On the 25th of April, French troops enter Carrasco, just 30 miles south of the Piedmontese capital, Turin. Meanwhile, General Beaulieu is at long last marching to Piedmont's aid. But he is a week late. And when he learns that Piedmont has opened negotiations with the enemy, he withdraws his troops in disgust, planning to take up new positions along the Po River. Takes his ball and goes Austrian home. troops join in the plunder of Piedmontese villages as they go. Victor Amadeus III, King of Piedmont Sardinia, sees no option but to accept Bonaparte's terms for an armistice. Piedmont must give up the strategic fortresses at Cuneo and either Alessandria or Tortona, leaving the country virtually defenseless. The final peace treaty, signed three weeks later in Paris, cedes Nice and Savoie to France and grants free passage to French armies. Napoleon has ended the four-year war with Piedmont. 
in less than three weeks. A four-year war. This young whippersnapper from Corsica comes in and puts a stop to it in three weeks. But it's just getting started. You have yet done nothing, for there still remains much to do. Setting expectations. I like it. The army of Italy has little time to rest on its laurels. Four days later, having received 7,000 reinforcements and fresh supplies, it's on the move again. Napoleon plans to invade the rich province of Lombardy, ruled by the Emperor of Austria, and defeat Bolio's army. But first he must cross the Po River, which is closely watched by Austrian forces. Rivers, waterways, they're always so huge in these, not only because of the ability to dig in defensively behind them and control the choke points of bridges or destroy bridges to prevent the enemy from crossing and slow them down, but they also become ways you can supply your army and do it quickly. It will prove one of Napoleon's most brilliant maneuvers. Massena is ordered to make conspicuous preparations to cross the river near Sale assembling boats and building gun batteries. Meanwhile, Napoleon has formed a new elite brigade. 5,000 grenadiers, carabiniers and chasseurs to act as the army's advance guard. Under the chasseurs, uh, I believe the word roughly trans translates as hunter, so like Jaeger in German. They're basically a quick light, light infantry, uh, like a, a shock troop type of thing. Command of General D'Alemagne. This force is ordered to march rapidly east to Piacenza and cover 40 miles in just 36 hours. They are followed by La Arp's division, then Augereau and the cavalry. Berlio receives reports that French troops are moving east and begins to redeploy his forces, while remaining conscious that there are still French troops that might cross the Po as far west as Valencia. This uncertainty makes it impossible for him to concentrate his forces. What you want? What's more, he's completely underestimated the scale and speed of Napoleon's move. A common problem that enemies of Napoleon will face throughout these campaigns is underestimating what he can do with his army. The French advance guard, with Colonel Lann in the lead, crosses the Po on the 7th of May chasing off Austrian patrols that are the only opposition. By the next morning, most of La Arps and Augereau's divisions and the cavalry are across, consolidating the French bridgehead, while Massena and Sagorier move to the crossing as fast as they can. Men of General Liebtai's division are the closest Austrian troops. They take up defensive positions at Fombio, but are overwhelmed by the French attack. That evening, Bolio's advance guard arrives, expecting to reinforce Liptai. Instead, they blunder into La Arp's division. In confused night fighting, General La Arp is shot dead, possibly by friendly fire. Yeah, I mean, Nap friendly fire is a problem in every war, and it's much more significant than people realize. I don't know what the statistics are for uh, Napoleonic Wars, but uh, in 20th century wars, it's typically right around 20%. Like one in five of your casualties are going to be friendly fire. Napoleon regards him as one of the army's best generals, and his loss a great blow. Bolio, realizing that the French have crossed the Po in force and now threaten to cut him off, orders a rapid withdrawal east. Milan is to be sacrificed. The great fortress of Mantua will be his next refuge. The French advance guard is soon in pursuit. On the morning of the 10th of May, they catch the Austrian rearguard at Lodi. Lodi is, uh, like everything in Ohio, uh, a name that we have a town of here in Ohio. It's right outside of Akron. 
Uh, Ohio is filled with like hundreds and hundreds of towns and cities that are named after European towns and cities. French troops chase the Austrians across town and over the town's 200-yard bridge over the River Adda. But when they try to follow, they find the bridge is swept by fire from 14 guns. Its far end is held by three battalions of Croatian infantry. Choke points. Several more battalions and cavalry squadrons are behind them in reserve. So what are your options here if you're Napoleon, right? You either call off the attack, you charge across this bridge and suffer heavy casualties and hope that they don't get bottlenecked there. And, you know, a small we've seen battle after battle in history where a small force can hold a choke point against a much larger, more powerful force. Or you find a way to go around somewhere. What is your option here? And how quickly can you make those options a reality? Around six and a half thousand men in total. Napoleon soon arrives and positions guns to bombard the Austrians on the far bank. He got his artillery. An artillery duel rages for much of the afternoon. And what's Napoleon's background? He's an artillery guy. Napoleon sends Beaumont's cavalry brigade upstream to Go look around. for a ford so they can cross the river and flank the Austrian defenses. But he grows impatient. Massena's division has begun to arrive from the south, bringing his strength up to 15,000 men and 30. So he's got them better than two to one at this point, but he's got this choke point still. And uh, here's the thing about artillery. Artillery is not often going to um, destroy or weaken an enemy position to where you can just walk through it. But what it often will do for you is, is cause the enemy to be pinned down. This is in the 20th century they will use this tactic of suppressing fire while you outflank the enemy. Same concept here at the Battle of Shiloh in the Civil War, for example. Uh, Ruggles battery is going to pin down the uh, U.S. forces that are in the hornet's nest. The artillery doesn't destroy those men, but it causes them to be pinned down enough to where they can't prevent the flanking maneuver that's happening. He guns. Napoleon makes a speech to the infantry, taunting them daring them to take the bridge, then orders them forward. To cries of Vive la République, the hardened 2nd Carabinier Battalion leads the charge. They come under torrential fire from the Austrian guns. Takes guts to do that. But urged on by Napoleon, Berthier, Massena, Lannes and others, French infantry surge across, under and around the bridge. Faced with this irresistible onslaught, the Austrian front line crumbles. And with French cavalry across the river to the north, the rest of the Austrian rearguard begins an orderly withdrawal. That's quite something. You're assaulting a heavily defended position that's got artillery and guns on a choke point, and you inflict four to one casualties? Mm. Now he's starting to feel it, right? That goes to your head quick. Five days after his victory at Lodi, Napoleon leads his army into the city of Milan. They are welcomed by cheering crowds. Though in reality, Italians are deeply divided in their attitudes towards the French. After Lodi, French soldiers have a new nickname for their general, Le Petit Caporal, the Little Corporal. It's a term of affection, because he gets his hands dirty, even aiming the guns himself, the job of an artillery corporal. That's, that tells you a lot, right, about his relationship with his men, and men will fight for a guy who's there on the ground with them, who shows that he's willing to share in what they're doing, and who gets them victory after victory after victory, right? And, and listen, all this stuff about his size, was he average height for the time? Yeah, he was a little bit on the short side. A average height for the time is 5'8". He's like 5'6". Um, so he, he wasn't quite as short as what 
British propaganda and others would say. But, you know, I mean, he would be the equivalent. Today, he'd probably be 5'8", which is exactly what Joaquin Phoenix is, who's playing him in the movie. He's 5'8". So uh, if we're talking in relation to average height, think about a guy who would be about 5'8 today. In just a month, Napoleon has transformed a war-weary, disheveled and demoralized army into a victorious fighting force, brimming with esprit de corps and eager for further conquests. While he, in his first campaign, has demonstrated extraordinary energy, mastery of detail, brilliant military intuition, above all, indomitable self-belief. Yeah, all important. It is this quality that inspires his soldiers to risk their lives for glory, for the Republic, and for the man they will one day acclaim, their Emperor. Good start. This is good stuff. I'm looking forward to the next three episodes to learn more. We'll take a look at those in the coming days. Uh, like I said, check out the gaming channel probably later today. First episode of my series playing through the Napoleonic Wars uh, on Napoleon Total War. Links in the description. Check out the rest of our series looking at the Napoleonic Wars. And we'll be back tomorrow with the next episode. Thanks for watching.